morning, uh, uh, good, good, good afternoon for some of, uh, of uh, participants. Uh, I would like to welcome all the guests, speakers and uh, donors of the regional Pulsar program. Um, my name is Ivana Vajaha. I'm a senior financial management specialist at the World Bank Global Practice, uh, working in Europe and Central Asia. I'm also a task team leader for a Pulsar component dedicated to raising awareness of reform rationale related to implementation and promotion of accrual accounting in public sector. And one of our products under this component is a knowledge paper on drivers of public sector accounting reforms. Uh, this paper was prepared by our team, including Ranjan Ganguly, Oksana Druta, with contribution of our peer reviewers, panelists, uh, and uh, under guidance of our practice manager, Dan Boyce, and also uh, program manager, Arman Vatian. One of uh, the problems encountered in many countries uh, is actually and was slow progress in preparation and implementation of accrual accounting reforms. Uh, while the reforms and accrual accounting have obvious benefits uh, from improved uh, uh, performance management, transparency, accountability, availability of financial information, um, um, there were some kind of the problems in setting up, starting of the uh, reform. I was uh, asking myself uh, some questions uh, a couple of times, why in some countries preparation and implementations go smoothly uh, and uh, brings uh, tangible results. And in other countries, um, the reform never starts uh, due to lack of decisions or maybe uh, some other um, factors. And even if some initial le legislation uh, changes are implemented, then there is a huge problem with uh, implementation. So um, I hope that this paper and the event today will uh, shed some light on the motivation and the good drivers of the reforms, but also uh, how to tackle um, obstacles. I would like now to give floor to Dan Boyce, our governance practice uh, manager, uh, uh, the World Bank for uh, opening remarks. Thank you, Ivana, and good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, today, we're really pleased to launch the publication of this uh, report, uh, which is a product of the Pulsar program. Uh, Pulsar, for those who you, of, the, of you who don't know, is a regional and country level program of 13 countries in Europe and Central Asia. It supports the enhancement of public sector accounting, which we usually call PSA and uh, financial reporting frameworks also in line with the international standards and good practices. Uh, Pulsar is uh, implemented thanks to the kind financial support from the governments of Austria and uh, Switzerland. Uh, the objective of this paper uh, is to help the governments understand uh, and uh, deal with issues that they're facing when they're implementing public sector accounting reforms, especially to identify, consider, and nurture these drivers of those reforms, which we'll be talking more about, and then take them into consideration in their reform strategy. Uh, we had this in mind because uh, the World Bank's experience all around the world is that these drivers are somehow especially important for PSA um, because these reforms don't come like some other reforms with automatic champions or incentives uh, to be implemented. Um, you can compare them, for example, to IFRS implementation, where uh, you may have national laws that require IFRS reporting or um, other factors that have an immediate impact of how the investors may view a company. So if you don't implement IFRS, you don't get investment or your shareholders uh, may not uh, support the company. Uh, whereas PSA reform involves more complex dynamics, sometimes within the government, sometimes outside, and uh, several stakeholders are involved, but they meet, may need to be regularly reminded of, of the value uh, of accrual accounting and uh, the related uh, reporting aspects. <clears throat> Effective and efficient 
PSA reform implementation also depends on the country context. And uh, each of you know that your country situations can be different. The transition to accrual accounting may, be, may vary based on objectives, strategic concerns, political support, uh, the capacity that exists to implement it, administrative traditions and, and formats, um, formal procedures and so on. Uh, this complexity really is the reason that countries often come to the bank or IFAC or others to, to get information on how to drive the how to drive the reforms uh, efforts and make them more successful. The public sector accounting reforms are often usually treated as technical, and that's maybe a mistake that even, that the World Bank has also made in the past. Uh, they see it as narrow, kind of maybe in the government seen as low priority, and uh, some often also just too complex, too difficult to understand, not only for the general public, but also to the politicians who may need uh, to support it. These reforms are not really hot topics for the media, or they don't come out in political campaigns, uh, or they don't appeal to the general public, uh, unless there's some problem discovered, as we saw in the debt crisis in Greece, for example, where debt was clearly not being measured and, uh, and disclosed correctly. Uh, only those types of situations put, put the public sector accounting in the spotlight. Um, other examples are just chronic budget deficits or uh, growing uh, debt levels or, or questions on the measurement of these. Uh, lack of funding sometimes to deliver services or, or misuse of funds uh, in, in public finance. So when these things happen, the main question can be raised on the transparency and the accountability of public finance, how the resources are generated, uh, whether the funds are spent effectively and efficiently, what are the assets and the liabilities, uh, and then uh, specifically on the liabilities, of course, the debt, uh, and all of these really require the, the proper measurement uh, to, to be relevant. I think uh, this information can be best obtained in accrual-based financial statements that have been prepared in accordance with acceptable accounting standards subject to audit, um, but we're still struggling to get this message through uh, in many countries. Often, even if the public sector accounting reform has been introduced, the focus Focuses, the focus is mainly on these technical aspects, such as the regulatory framework, the capacity building for the implementation process, uh, maybe information systems, but without proper identification of the real drivers and the obstacles to reform, including political economy aspects, uh, these uh, reforms can, can really struggle uh, because they can be uh, either lack support or, or be specifically blocked um, when, when the reforms are, are taking place. So today we want to understand and find the real drivers of reform. We think it's necessary to prepare and implement successful and, and useful reforms and, and also uh, strategies for the medium term to address these obstacles and focus on, on, the, on the drivers uh, and, and not focus on the, what we might call the wrong drivers of, of the reforms. Without these strong drivers behind them and, and in support of the reforms, uh, the, the result can be either very slow process or even failure uh, because the natural tendency, as we know in many areas, is to stay with the status quo. Uh, which in this case for accounting uh, may have been in place for several decades and really doesn't require much effort to maintain. So the choice is, the easy choice is, is just to continue doing what, whatever is being done. So this paper analyzes various types of drivers and, and provides case studies from, the, from four countries, Albania, Austria, Georgia, and Switzerland. Um, and we think the lessons can be very useful, which we're go going to hear more about uh, today. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, thanks for joining us. And we hope you will you'll actively listen and participate. And I welcome you now to the main sessions of the dissemination event of today. Thank you, Dan. Uh, now I would like to invite Verena Fritz, uh, our senior financial uh, public sector specialist at the World Bank. Um, she's a PhD in political science and uh, 
author of and co-author of many publications, including in uh, on political economy, which is very important in actually uh, assessing the uh, the drivers and the reforms. So, Verena, please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, Verena, Verena you are muted. We cannot hear you. We cannot hear you, Verena, for some reason. Maybe it's because of your set. Sometimes there are problems if you are using headsets, but... We cannot, I cannot hear you. Irene is trying to reconnect. Okay, so we are waiting a while for reconnection, although we, we, uh, we heard uh, Verena at the beginning, so and there was some kind of the technical issue. So in the meantime, um, as this is a webinar, uh, so actually if you would like to ask the questions, we are asking you to use a question, a chat channel. Just actually, actually you can write because we have only possibility to pose the questions uh, through this channel. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you well. Perfect. Sorry about that. There was something, you know, sometimes the best laid plans don't work quite out. Um, Let's see where the yeah. All right, I hope this is coming through now as a full screen. And let me go here. So, audio okay? Video okay? Yes, yes. Yes, right. I'm okay. Is okay. All right, apologies for that. So, I'll just briefly present uh, on some wider research on drivers of reform uh, and impact on political economy on reform adoption and implementation. This was is based on research on PFM reforms in general and their underlying political economy drivers, both again in terms of design decisions on what to adopt implementation and then also the issue of sustaining reforms and ensuring that reforms have the expected impacts, but focusing in on those aspects that are particularly relevant uh, for the accounting reforms that are under discussion here. And sorry, what just happened? Um, 
also, let me just say that I'm very pleased and, and happy that there has been this attention. So it's great to see that these kinds of non-technical drivers are gaining increasing attention in a, in a really wide variety of areas, including uh, various aspects of public sector reform. So one that uh, many of you might also have some interest in is the issue of uh, improving SOE uh, governance. For example, we also see that there is an increasing interest in how that is affected by political economy drivers. Now with that brief introduction, um, so we see that generally PFM reforms have attracted an a increased amount of financing over the past two decades. And there is often quite similar technical reform uh, recommendations and intentions and I'll show a little bit more on that later, yet the reform results and the pace of actual reform implementation varies quite considerably from country to country and also from across different uh, time periods. So the question then is, um, many people know that there's some uh, idea of politics and stakeholders to matter, but a lot of that discussion has been quite anecdotal. So it's kind of the residual in many reports that political commitment may have been insufficient, but it's not more systematically assessed. So that's a little bit what we're trying to do uh, and also what, what this report that was just published is, is trying to achieve. I think just to briefly present a little bit on where we are in terms of overall um, public financial management improvements and relating that uh, two incomes per capita. So on the x-axis, you see uh, um, a way of assessing income per capita, and then on the y-axis, the aggregate uh, PEFA assessment. So when you assemble all of the public expenditure-related uh, PEFA scores, what is the picture that you see? Uh, and this includes all uh, regions of the world. And the earliest ones are from circa 2007 to 2011. And then the later, the one on the right-hand side is um, the most recent update. So those are uh, mostly PEFA assessments post-2016. One thing that you can see is that ECA, so the countries that we have around the table today, generally perform well. Uh, Georgia is one leader, Turkey is here, Azerbaijan, Moldova, Kosovo. So most ECA countries have been doing quite well overall on PEFA, on, the ref on PFM reforms as measured uh, by PEFA, of course, with some variation. So there is also some laggards here, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, and so on. But the general capacity and general system improvements uh, have largely been in place. So a level of three, if you want, is an ad average C score of those of for you uh, familiar with the PEFA methodology. And then here the 3.5 and of course a four would be a, sorry, this is a B level and then that would be the A level uh, to be achieved. So it's quite, quite good performance in general. But of course there's always uh, many things to do and you can have one fairly good PEFA assessment followed by a, a period of greater difficulty. So just to show here the one for Georgia on the upper left-hand corner. So that was a very nice uh, period of progress between 2008 and 2013. And I'm sure it's progressed further over time and e fairly even across different dimensions uh, of the PEFA. Then you see here from another country where four assessments have been done over time where you see a, a more uneven uh, pattern of progress, including sometimes progression and then sometimes also regression over time. So not all reforms that are attempted at some point in time actually stick. Uh, just to say that, you know, putting when you have uh, a number of different PEFAs that were done for your respective country, it can be really a nice way uh, to having this kind of snapshot at a glance that summarizes at a glance how this fits across the six buckets of the PEFA system and whether there has been really continued progress over time or also some backsliding, which can be an important aspect. So if we have this variation across places and across time, uh, what, does, what explains that? How can we explain this variation? Um, and so 
we're looking at uh, three uh, big areas. One is the big picture. So how does the PFM reforms and accounting system reforms relate to overall policy goals that a government has and the political incentives that it faces? How does it relate to the institutions and legal provisions as well as citizen demand for reforms? And then how does that relate to the specific uh, aspects and how they are fitting together? So looking briefly at the big picture, or starting from the big picture and institutional uh, layout of the land, we've considered three types of factors. So are there any particular electoral promises and does the government have a fairly strong mandate to pursue reforms? So some governments just say, well, you know, we'll keep the ship steady and that's all we're promising. And then usually that doesn't necessarily translate into strong efforts at reforming how the public sector operates. It might still, um, depending on what was agreed and developed over time, uh, but it's not a, it, you shouldn't expect a strong push in this environment. Then there is an issue of overarching policy goals and challenges um, and the need to react to fiscal trends. So sometimes the fiscal situation is easy uh, due to a variety of factors. If growth has been good, um, no new challenges, or we can have time periods uh, as after the global financial crisis, or as we see currently where the fiscal situation tightens and becomes more difficult and that can uh, motivate efforts at finding savings uh, and getting better controls and so on. And that can also be a stimulus uh, for further efforts at accounting reforms. Then the legal and institutional factors uh, matter both as a starting point and as a target of reforms. So how difficult or how easy is it to mandate uh, a certain uh, degree of changes? What is the role of the central finance agency in this, mostly the Ministry of Finance? What role is being played by other key institutional um, uh, elements of, of a country's system? And then what is the starting point? Is there an organic uh, PFM law or multiple uh, key laws that uh, exist ex ante? What is the ex external audit legislation looking like, uh, laws on procurement, et cetera? Again, that's more sort of for the PFM system overall. And then there's specifics that will apply to the issue of pursuing public sector accounting reforms. Perhaps one that is uh, more important for these accounting reforms than for other aspects of PFM is, of course, also what is happening in, with respect to private sector accounting in a country. Um, then we, can, we also considered uh, the demand side. And I think something that uh, Ivona hinted at, usually citizens don't have a strong understanding or insight into these kinds of reforms and accounting reform may be one of the most hidden parts of, of the PFM reform agenda that you could have from the perspective of an everyday citizen. So that translates into not very much direct um, demand from citizens to politicians to take certain actions. Citizens do sometimes take an interest in public sector wage uh, reforms, whether there's bonuses or how people are employed. And there is a general interest in anti-corruption reforms in many countries and in many time periods, but also that varies. We looked at five countries over a period of 10 to 15 years specifically as part of this research. And I think many of you can relate to this for your own country and just went through a little bit what were the specific reform, PFM reform elements that were included in standard documents such as PFM reform plans or reform strategies. And what one really finds is that is quite a comprehensive package almost across any country, including typically the introduction of IPSAS in recent years. At the same time, the actual binding constraints of the fiscal system of the PFM system actually varies more across countries. So some countries really struggle with the timeliness of budget approvals. That can be, is something that has been resolved in many places, but it can recur uh, due to various factors. 
Sometimes cash management poses a major challenge. Uh, it can also be for certain periods of time, again, when the fiscal situation becomes more tense. Uh, sometimes there, is, uh, there are challenges in institutional coherence between planning uh, budget preparation and budget execution. And there's also considerable uh, variation in the degree and quality of public finance transparency. Um, and then international standards, of course, of which IPSAS is an important one, play an increasing role, um, not just in this area, but also with regards to, for example, external audit, with regards to procurement reform. And it's kind of an ongoing debate, right? Should countries simply adopt international standards? What is the benefit of that? Should they uh, consider some kind of national adaptation and so on? Uh, international standards can provide very important anchors, uh, sort of a focus of, of where to go and what is an acceptable standard. One uh, point that we observe and that we find to be uh, too little discussed uh, often is that partial and incomplete reforms are quite common, but they're not clearly acknowledged. Um, so some examples are, for example, the medium term expenditure frameworks. They're used to define some broad goals, uh, but they're not really firmly established as, firm, as, as sort of firmer ceilings and to clearly plan over multiple years. We also find uh, many halfway treasury single accounts. So some accounts are unified, but others still remain outside of that system. Um, IT systems uh, exist in many places, FMISs, but not all of the modules that are formally in place are actually used as intended. And in the uh, sphere of budgeting, we see that program budgets uh, often have been introduced in almost any country but the line item budgets remain the legally binding ones. Partial reforms are not per se problematic if they are sort of an intermediate stage of going from an original system to a new system. But we see that there is a few uh, key problems. So one is the recognition as such. So it can be confusing when uh, many stakeholders say, well, we have this system, but the, in fact, this only exists halfway. It can also be a signal of stalled progress that there's too much resistance from somebody and it, the system is sort of stuck in this in-between world. And it can be problematic if there is a clash between what is prescribed in regulations and what is actually happening in practice. And that can be a particular problem, I think, for accounting reforms. Um, we look at these experiences with transitioning accounting across the five case studies uh, countries. Um, so what we noticed, and again, this is a little bit uh, a few years ago that we looked at this very intensively. Um, there was a lot of attention to what standards are being used, uh, but not yet very much attention to the issue of what quality of information does this actually produce and make available for different stakeholders and for different uh, stages of the budget process and the budget execution process. Um, there was also some concerns across countries about the cost of transitioning, but quite not as much um, uh, specific assessment of where the costs are, what the level is and so on the reliability of the use of the standards and the implications in terms of readability of accounts by various stakeholders. So let me come to some uh, implications and recommendations from this picture. And of course, you know, presenting it somewhat uh, selectively given the time that we have. One aspect is to be clearer about the goals of the reforms and how they relate to key current and foreseeable future fiscal and PFM challenges. So are, is one of the motivations that there are certain problems with, such as cash management, uh, keeping track of arrears, or are these not an issue? And is there any concern that they would recur as an issue in the future? Uh, are there significant uh, future pension and healthcare costs, fiscal risks from SOEs? Is that an uh, important uh, motivation? So being clear on what is the motivation can also help to advocate, right? Why is this important? 
and at the same time being cautious about overstating the expected uh, benefits or assuming that there is an automatic translation from um, adopting certain standards to um, achieving a certain impact. So sometimes there have been statements such as, well, if only international um, public sector accounting standards were used, that would help to eliminate corruption and mismanagement. That sort of oversee, overlooks that there's other complementary factors that need to move in the right direction. Uh, as mentioned, citizens may not be very interested, but it may still be worth thinking about how one can engage citizens and more organized groups in a meaningful way. So that uh, goes back to this issue of being clear about what objectives, what bigger objectives does this uh, link to, and to try and explain it in sort of plain English or in plain uh, everyday terms of how this matters and how it will link from adopting the standard to actually achieving uh, the overall objective. There may also be new opportunities and new demand uh, related to better capturing climate and environmental aspects. And those are, of course, also uh, long-term issues and asset-related asset issues. Um, being clear about the institutional arrangements and roles uh, in terms of assessing likely difficulties and mapping a transition path including attention to the relationship with subnational levels and how those will be involved and the voice and role of sector ministries and their views, especially if where they play a, a, an important role with regard, say, to the pension system. Um, how well do different stakeholders use existing information? So what is the sort of um, feedback loop uh, currently between the information that is being produced and the actual utilization of that information for policy decision making. And uh, there's typically uh, opportunities to engage with stakeholders and with these various institutions without assuming a simple dichotomy that there are those who are in, sub in uh, support of reform and those that are against people or different institutional stakeholders have views based on uh, what their main roles are and what they're meant to achieve, as well as to sometimes what their main fears and concerns are. Um, should reform designers deliberately target partial reforms? I'd be very interested to hear in the panel discussion if that is considered as an option and what experiences are. So looking at uh, what has happened in other countries, while again being careful about partial reforms that are not acknowledged and that open up this formal informal gaps that, that can be really quite a problematic situation. Um, considering reform complementarity, so accounting reforms may need to be matched by attention to fiscal transparency to be really meaningful. And considering also risks of unintended negative consequences and how those can be guarded again. So costs of transition, costs or problems related to partial uh, reforms, and uh, also the opportunities for potentially fudging the numbers and if there's any risk of that being increased by any of the uh, stakeholders involved. And then attention to sustainability and impact. So sometimes reforms remain formalistic rather than for, uh, fully utilized and monitoring actual utilization is something that uh, often we do not quite invest enough in. Um, so making sure that there is a veracity of accounting after the introduction of new standards and looking at that closely enough. Uh, the PEFA report doesn't uh, really cover that. So what are our tools to have not just rely on internal uh, cycles and assessments, but also perhaps some external validation. And uh, then seeking continuous improvements. So does that feedback loop to inform debates and policy making actually happen? Uh, and are there any missing elements that may need to be addressed? So thank you very much. This is the just a quick, these are the links to the original research that we did on this PE aspects of PFM reforms and a recent update on some of the data analysis. Thank you. 
Thank you, Verena, for these very insightful presentations on uh, broader aspects of uh, uh, PFM reforms uh, and uh, accounting reforms. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I would like to uh, welcome our representatives of donors, uh, Agnes Drimel from Ministry of uh, uh, Finance uh, of Ast Austria and uh, Thomas Straufer, a representative of, of SECO. And now uh, I would like to uh, invite Ranjan Ganguly to present uh, key findings and messages from, from our paper, Drivers of Public Sector Accounting, which is available in uh, our Pulsar, Pulsar languages on uh, our website, CFRR, um, sub-website for Pulsar. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we can also see the presentation. Cool. So, yes, yeah, good afternoon. And uh, I'll just quickly take you through the main highlights of the paper before we go on to the panel discussion. I'm Ronjan Ganguly uh, and I help write it. Um, so the paper recognises that the countries have different starting points in their public sector accounting reform different capabilities and different drivers. And it is important to acknowledge these differences in setting your country's reform objectives and reform paths. Um, often, as Dan and Verena have said, drivers aren't fully thought of. Um, so there are different types of drivers of public sector accounting reform. Drivers are one of the main things that influence something will cause it to happen, make progress, develop, change or grow stronger. Essentially, without a driver, not much happens. The right driver will cause whole system improvements, be measurable in practice and in results, and have a clear link to the transformation strategy. Um, the right drivers, which include capacity building, group work, instructions and systemic solutions, are effective because they work directly on changing the culture of the systems. A wrong driver, on the other hand, may sound good, but actually does not produce the results it seeks. It may make matters worse, and on closer scrutiny can never have the impact it promises. Uh, wrong drivers alter procedures and other formal attributes of the system, such as laws or rules or regulations, but without reaching the internal substance of reform, and that's why they fail. So the glue that binds effective drivers together is the underlying attitude, philosophy, and theory of action. So I take you through a couple of types of uh, drivers uh, of, of reform. There, essentially, there are internal drivers which are internal to the country and external ones which are coming from outside the country. And within those, there are technical drivers and non-technical drivers. Technical drivers are non-political, they're tangible, they're usually easier objectively to assess and address. So the ones from within the country, internal ones, could include a drive for better transparency and accountability, um, a drive for better management of strategic resources, drive for improved awareness and management of costs, and general drivers which require better public sector accounting, such as uh, a drive for better fiscal position or management of financial risks. Non-technical drivers are much more about relationships political economy and tangible, they're difficult objectively to assess and address. There's usually power that comes associated with non-technical drivers. So examples from within the country are institutions, government, legislatures, courts, media, NGOs, formal and informal institutions may have different drivers for what makes them want to achieve whatever they want to achieve. They, so they have different interests and they have different ideas, what kind of policy options and recommendations they may have from whatever their research and values are. We also have external 
uh, drivers. These come from outside the country. And again, they can also be technical and non-technical. So the non-political, tangible, easier to objectively assess and address technical drivers include, for example, you need to comply with the EU's Article 126 on excessive government deficit obligations, or you may need to produce uh, reports in accordance with ESA 2010, or whatever are the other standards. Uh, you may have uh, a drive to produce international accounting standards reports, fiscal rules and indicators, you may need to monitor your compliance with them. There may have been public finance assessments that come out with recommendations, and there may also be software. I think uh, one of our panelists will talk about the drivers from uh, enterprise resource software solutions. You can also have non-technical external drivers. So that is aid, uh, and donors may link aid to specific um, input improvements in uh, public sector uh, financial management, including accounting. Credit rating agencies may, may drive uh, commercial creditors, and there may also be other global drivers. We can think of um, we can think of challenges and obstacles to public sector accounting reform, and they're often fairly well documented in the Verena list of a few. Um, and when we think of these challenges and obstacles, I won't go through them all, but you could think about what are the drivers behind those challenges and obstacles, and you may then find um, good drivers and bad drivers. So, for example, with leadership you may have the lack of a leader or weak or unstable political support. So maybe one of the challenges there is to find leaders or find some kind of common elements to get common political support, and that may act as a driver. Project management is often a, a challenge and an obstacle. So for example, there may be a piecemeal approach. People may want different parts of public financial management addressed. Well, if you can somehow find a common element between all these pieces, then you may develop a strong driver, such as, for example, management of your fiscal risks. There are resources that may also be a challenge and an obstacle. So if there are lots of, uh, you know, if there's a lack of staff to implement things, then maybe you may think, okay, we need to have uh, a few staff doing a few things we can do so that they create a driver rather than being spread thinly over many activities and then it acts as a weak driver. So practical observations. Um, the best results for public sector accounting reforms seem to be achieved if there's a good mix of internal, that's within the country, external from outside the country, technical as well as non-technical drivers that could support not only the start, but also the full implementation of public sector reform. I mean, often uh, reform is there's a lot of energy at the start, but it is a long process. So you need to think about how can you create drivers that will last throughout the whole process, or maybe you will change drivers from the start to the middle to the end. In, in echo countries in particular, public sector accounting reform seems to have been initiated in the main by external technical drivers, that's from outside the country, rather than domestic drivers. So and in particular, the EU, uh, for, for the countries in, in, in the Pulsar countries, particularly, you know, the, the EU seems to be a driver, aid seems to come linked to it. Um, the encouragement of development partners, um, public sector accounting, so with the encouragement of development partners, public sector accounting reform has often been included within government's broader PFM reform strategies, and whilst that's good at the start, that doesn't always last through to the end. Internal technical drivers, such as putting things in the law and regulations, are often not sufficient to implement public sector accounting reform because you do need political support and buy-in from groups of stakeholders. Otherwise, there are many carve-outs and exceptions that, that somehow become implemented in public sector accounting reform. Uh, the final slide is on various ideas to assess your drivers. So these are, there's not, um, 
There doesn't seem, unfortunately, to be one tool that can assess all drivers. But an ideal tool would, to support public sector accounting form, would include not only a diagnosis of the current accounting framework, but also capacity and practice and guide on formulation of roadmaps, drivers and obstacles to the reform. Um, we have some technical tools, uh, particularly this World Bank diagnostic tool, the report on enhancement of public sector financial reporting, and I think quite a few of the Pulsar countries have used this, and that helps compare your um, public sector accounting framework with international norms. But next generate, there is a next generation assessment tool planned, I understand, that will also facilitate the preparation of the reform plans and help identify drivers and our obstacles or reforms or political, or political economy issues that can either support or hinder reforms. There are no neat and easy methods of assessing non-technical drivers. Um, there used to be a World Bank tool called the Institutional and Governments Review, which focused on the functioning of key public institutions. And you can look at some of those in the report. Um, it's also worth noting about windows of opportunity, which are not just about which are the drivers, but sometimes you have to take opportunistic um, initiatives to build on what little drivers there are. Thank you very much. And I'll pass back to Yvonne. Thank you very much, Ranjan, uh, for this uh, presentation. And now I would like to open uh, a panel discussion. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Dritan Fino, Director at Ministry of Finance Albania, Bernard Schatz, a member of the uh, IPSAS Board uh, and Senior Manager at PricewaterhouseCoopers Austria, uh, David uh, Gamer Krelidze, Head of the Department, Ministry of Finance, Georgia, Zandro Fuchs, uh, uh, from uh, Head of the Center of Public Financial Management in Zurich University School of uh, Management and Law in Switzerland, and Verena Fritz. I know that Verena will be leaving uh, by 3 p.m., so um, um, I would like to first ask uh, whatever there are any questions from the audience, because I would like to give priority to these live questions. Uh, um, you can either try to speak um, in English or, or write the question into the chat. Uh, I do not see any questions for now, but I have, of course, prepared a set of questions for our panelists. And uh, the first questions to all of the countries involved uh, in the interviews, I would like to ask you, uh, whatever you could describe the key drivers of uh, whatever technical or non-technical of the reform uh, in your country. Uh, and uh, of course, the paper is suggesting that uh, uh, such drivers as law IT system and formal processes are easy to assess and address whatever non-technical drivers such as uh, uh, institutions, political support are, are more difficult to manage during the implementation. So uh, I would like to start with uh, Dritan first uh, for the for this answer. And uh, I will ask all the participants for the quick, uh, quick answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, it's a pleasure being here and to discuss about the, uh, let's say, the reform in the public sector accounting, uh, the importance of the reform in the public sector accounting. As you may know, Albania uh, has undertaken a reform to, to, implement, uh, to implement IPSAS in its, uh, in its uh, public sector, uh, to implement the accrual accounting. We are currently using the modified uh, accrual basis accounting but uh, we are moving to a, to a full accrual basis. Uh, for this, we are also having the direct support from the, uh, from the, World, uh, from the World Bank uh, through a project in order to, uh, to assist us to uh, implement and to undertake this uh, challenging, challenging reform in our country. Uh, there are a lot of... Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, Issues. There are a lot of challenges, but I'll focus to uh, to 
to, to your questions, what are the main drivers that, uh, I mean, uh, let's say, uh, have impacted uh, this, uh, this reform in our country. I mean, we all know that the uh, high quality uh, public state financial reporting is the cornerstone of uh, the functional public sector and uh, improving the quality uh, of financial reporting information in the public sector will have in Albania a positive impact uh, for all the citizens and for the international community as well. Uh, uh, I, 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 I will uh, mention some of the main drivers, which relates to, first of all, uh, the idea of the tool of counting the uh, enhanced let's say, public safe financial reporting uh, uh, it would mean that uh, more uh, transparency and more accountability uh, uh, by the decision makers, by the politicians, and by uh, uh, I can't help invest you. by investors would be would be expected. Uh, it is really, uh, it's really important that uh, better information, a more complete information, will aid better decision making in all uh, in all levels of, uh, of public sector uh, in Albania. Uh, definitely, uh, uh, we uh, uh, currently we have a scarce uh, and not a fragmented accounting uh, accounting uh, framework in, in the country. We are very reliable information on assets or reliable information on, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, inventories, uh, it's, it's, it's missing. And a more reliable information on, on, on these important elements uh, will uh, we'll provide on, on, on assets and uh, on our stocks and etc. Uh, the entities that process will provide better information and uh, we'll provide, uh, uh, we'll make possible uh, better use and uh, uh, using them uh, more efficiently economically, which means that in the end, uh, we could provide to the public more uh, economic, uh, economic uh, services. Uh, uh, definitely, uh, Another important, uh, another important element I mentioned, uh, taking into consideration the fact that we are already uh, have already implemented a reform of uh, pub, of private sector accounting. Uh, it would be it would be uh, let's say uh, 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 it, another 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 driver an important driver is to harmonize these both uh, both type of accounts, let's say the ones for the private sector and one for the public sector, which uh, would uh, uh, to make it uh, much more easy to, uh, uh, let's say, provide the necessary and uh, deliver the necessary services to all, uh, uh, all parties concerned. Uh, an important element, definitely, not only, not only government benefit from a better uh, better uh, information, but also non-governmental organizations, uh, which recently in our country are becoming more and more, uh, let's say, active, and uh, definitely a better, more transparent, and more reliable information will will uh, let's say will benefit this this uh, let's say uh, society in order to provide uh, better feedback on uh, on. Uh, government policies. So these are the main, the main drivers that I, uh, I like to mention in our case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and now I would like to uh, give the floor to Bernard Schatz to, to provide with uh, uh, key drivers uh, for Austrian um, public sector accounting reform. Sure, but uh, thank you. Uh, I just want to take the opportunity as well to uh, congratulate uh, Verena and Ranjan for this uh, excellent presentations because uh, I, I think they really highlight something which usually is not observable and is very intangible. 
Uh, but at the same time, it's crucial for uh, being successful with reforms to consider those soft uh, elements we, we discussed or we saw in the presentation. Um, I also want to highlight what Dan actually said in his introduction, that change will always create resistance, always. Uh, so it's a good point to, to keep that in mind and to, to actively, actively manage that. Um, and also to keep in mind, sometimes the harder you push, the, the bigger is the resistance you create. Um, and when it comes to the, the main drivers for Austria, actually, and we talk about the early 2000s, uh, uh, was actually that we were quite uh, unhappy in the Ministry of Finance uh, when it came to our own track record. Uh, we had a, a country running deficits for a very long period of time. And uh, we as a ministry, we didn't feel actually that we had every tool in the toolbox available uh, for ourselves to provide our politicians with the best information available. And um, that actually was the main the main driver to to really um, be better in a position to inform the politicians, the public, on uh, more sustainable decision making, and that that's uh, what created kind of the energy and what put the Minister of Finance at the heart of the of the reform at the time. Okay, so I understand that these were mainly internal drivers. You didn't have any kind of the external uh, external push. Uh, so this is actually very good. And I, I, I think that also it was uh, one of the reasons of the good results of the reform. Uh, so um, um, knowing that Verena will be leaving, so I would like to ask quick questions to Verena uh, on any kind of the advice, how uh, political economy aspects uh, uh, could be addressed in designing um, and implementation of the PSA reform in, in uh, ECA countries, in Pulsar countries, yes. Thank you, Ibona. And, and also thanks to the other speakers. Um, of course, yeah, so what Bernard just said of, is a very important, right? Having a clear, picture or a clear goal of what those seeking to, uh, to implement these reforms, what, is, what are they pursuing? What's motivating it? So if it is to address deficit issues, if it is to address long run uh, risk from pensions, which is a big issue in, an, in, a, in a region with a lot of aging populations. And as, as mentioned briefly earlier, if it is to address uh, environmental uh, pollution risks and the degradation of the natural environment that can be an important, more recently uh, important driver as we enter all a phase of uh, the green recovery. Then it might be relevant to also think about, okay, if this is the main motivation, then what are the main elements of this uh, accounting reform of uh, introducing accrual accounting that are aligned with that goal. So what is really important about the reform and maybe what element might be a little less important if one has to prioritize and it's difficult to do too many things at once. Um, and how can others be brought into this? So how can we explain that goal and how uh, the introduction of accrual accounting will contribute to these wider goals? Again, you know, the language of accounting, and I'm saying this as a non-accountant, sort of as a non-expert who has looked at this area uh, in some detail, it's not easy to communicate that in everyday language. And that's an effort that the community and those advocating for the reform uh, probably can do more about. To explain it to journalists, to explain it to parliamentarians, to explain it to people in the sector ministries, to explain it to the uh, politicians uh, that are expected to back these reforms. You may have ministers of finance who are economists and themselves, you know, they worry about inflation, they worry about reviving their economies, they have a number of different things they worry about on the table. And why is this contributing to these wider things that they worry about? Um, so I think that that may help and then mapping out uh, how to get uh, from, from the starting point to making the contributions to these wider goals in a realistic way. Thank you. Thank you, Varana. Uh, and now uh, the, the same questions on the main drivers of the reform in uh, your country. I would like to ask uh, David uh, to present uh, 
uh, Georgian experience. Hello, everybody. Hope you still hear me. Glad to be here. Uh, it's my pleasure. So thanks for having me. Uh, actually, a lot of has been already said, uh, and uh, my gratitude to presenters for sharing their interesting, fruitful experience. Well, uh, public sector accounting, uh, I think, heavily refers to government's financial information systems and financial disclosure practices. And I think everyone would admit that uh, it is often quite costly to produce and disseminate information. Uh, therefore, governments in various political systems may be kind of uh, lacking uh, economic incentives to do so. Uh, so the foremost driver for pushing things forward is, I guess, the political will. Uh, this, in fact, is uh, that I can say definitely from my country's experience. Uh, once there is uh, the political will, uh, and once it exists, uh, the funding and technical support come forward as, as the next necessities. Because, uh, uh, as I said, reforms do not come without cost. Uh, even more in some emerging market countries, and especially in, it is a case in their early stage of their economic development, the opportunity cost of resources used in improving government financial information may be and may seem to be quite high. Therefore, even if governments are not reluctant and uh, are willing to undertake government's accounting reform, uh, they may be just unable to afford it. And uh, that is the moment when international uh, relationships matter, when uh, developing partners should step in and take some actions. Uh, that was the case in Georgia, uh, when government asked international financial institutions and some bilateral donors to mobilize all necessary financial and technical assistance to support uh, uh, development of PFM reform agenda, including the PSA reform. Uh, so as, as you mentioned, actually key drivers include both technical and non-technical staff, non-technical aspects, uh, those the effectiveness of which can be uh, assessed easily or perhaps relatively hardly. Uh, but at the end of the day, what really matters is a high level of commitment to strengthening the governance, also engagement of senior officials as it was described in Georgian case study in the paper. Uh, everything this combined together with financial and uh, technical assistance from international financial institutions, development agencies, some bilateral donors. So this is what drives the public sector reforms, including public sector accounting. Uh, and uh, especially it is the case in the early stage of reforming process. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and now I would like to ask uh, Zandro Fuchs uh, to also uh, present very interesting uh, uh, experience from uh, Switzerland and uh, the drivers to, to make the reform happen. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure. And uh, first of all, I also would like to congratulate for, I would say, a really brilliant paper, a really timely paper, a really important paper. Uh, it was mentioned before, I think all these um, soft factors, as you call, these non-technical drivers, they are really, really important for reform success. Uh, the problem is they are hard to measure, not easy to measure, and um, that's why people often forget, forget about them. Um, just uh, brief considerations from um, Switzerland, and I think uh, Verena um, told it in her presentation. I think it is really, really important to consider what the fundamental problem of the reform is. And in Switzerland, the problem was really, really practical. They need or they needed to replace their um, SAP conf configurations. And at that time, SAP was not providing any SAP configuration purely for cash accounting. So it was configured for accrual accounting and that's somehow created an external driver for the government to proceed with your accrual accounting because they couldn't buy any off-the-shelf product from SAP which would 
um, continuously um, uh, suits their cash accounting. So there was basically one problem. So they had to change, replace their IT system, SAP system, and had to continue um, or couldn't continue with, with cash accounting. So that was one driver. And other driver was basically the parliament. So the parliament actually requested more comprehensive financial information. And the funny thing was that at these times, the states in Switzerland, which are autonomous, uh, were highly advanced in terms of accrual accounting. So they actually run accrual accounting systems, um, which let national parliamentarians to ask the government, what, how could that actually be that states, Swiss states are more advanced in accounting terms. So we actually want more comprehensive information. They actually asked it. So at the end, it was some sort of combination between technical drivers replacing a new IT system with non-technical drivers where the parliament actually asked for more and better information. And the last point, was, I think, and um, Switzerland did that, I would say, really well. They managed to set up a steering committee with, with representatives of technical um, uh, persons, um, you know, looking at um, accounting standards, looking at IT systems, but also non-technical. So representing the parliament, representing uh, finance commissions, representing audit, and that together actually fit well. And it would actually summarize what, um, uh, Ranchan said in, in his presentation that a, a fruitful combination of non-technical and technical drivers would actually lead to reform success. And I think that's why uh, Switzerland pretty well connects. Thank you, Sandra. I think that uh, we can envy uh, um, the level of the parliamentary uh, uh, awareness, yes, in Switzerland, because I cannot imagine such questions uh, for, in some of the countries in, 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 the, in the region. Um, uh, the next question, if, uh, because I do not see any questions uh, in the chat, but maybe if somebody would like to speak up, let me know by raising uh, hands. Um, okay, if not, I have another questions prepared. Um, uh, the paper actually su suggests that uh, there are different stakeholder groups, yes, and uh, which might have actually different drivers because they have different interests, different uh, benefits of keeping status quo or, or making the change, yes. So could you describe for your countries uh, the main stakeholder groups uh, with the, let's say, positive drive or maybe some, uh, let's say, wrong drivers uh, trying to stop uh, the reform or maybe even maybe not stopping, but not helping as well. So, um, so I, can, I can start now maybe from Bernhard. Sure, thank you, Ivana. Um, I think it's already been mentioned. Um, it, it's really important to get this, this whole uh, picture on public financial management systems, and ju not just the pure accounting part. Um, so, the, the reform was driven by in Austria by the Ministry of Finance, but we've been very aware that, that there are a couple of stakeholders actually we had to, to get on board. Uh, and the first I want to mention are the supervisory uh, institutions like the Supreme Audit uh, Institution, uh, the Court of Auditors, and the Parliamentarian uh, Budget Office, for example, or the Parliament itself. And it really was a big issue because uh, they're very positive. Uh, both of them were very positive in receiving more information, more comprehensive information for uh, scrutiny and then uh, holding the government for, uh, to accounts. But the trade-off actually kind of was that we said, okay, that's fine. So you're going to get a lot of more information. We're going to open our hearts and our chests to you. Uh, but at the same time, you have to support uh, where we are going. Right, so you have to give us the resources. You have to be positive on on uh, when when there's a lack of energy. You have to, to keep pushing, um, and, and that was quite quite an interesting and and, and fruitful actually uh, collaboration. I mean, uh, quite a stressful uh, from time to time. I have to confess, but uh, I think overall it was very beneficial, and. Um, I think the other part is really the, the line ministries. And I think it's easily overlooked actually what huge part uh, the, the, the line ministries and the other parts of the administration play in this system because they have to compile all the information. It's additional workloads for them. Uh, it's a, additional reporting schemes. They have to uh, answer to the parliament. And uh, 
so so we had to find a benefit for them right because it was clear that actually they had a a, a negative impact so to speak uh, and the positive impact was actually we said so if you have a better system um, reporting on your affairs you might be able to give you more managerial freedom so they they got more budget freedom to shift funds uh, within purposes within their ministries uh, because we could rely actually on their reporting and reporting on their affairs and I think that was quite a quite an interesting trade-off to make. Um, I also want to mention that in the in the parliament we had a, a special committee, with, which was just dedicated for you know monitoring the reform, and uh, all uh, parliamentarian parties they were allowed to nominate uh, external experts, uh, voice their opinions, but we also tried to be very clear that that's the level of of your involvement, right? So we want to hear you, we want your support, uh, but we're not going into details and we're not going to check, you know, each and every step uh, with the parliament because otherwise you get stuck. Um, So I think the the, the fragile element of of getting a lot of stakeholders to move in the same direction is always also associated with, uh, if you want to receive something, you have to be willing to give something up. Uh, and that's uh, what we tried to to take to heart when we uh, were managing the reform in Austria. Thank you. So this is a very, very interesting observation. So uh, you did your homework and you identified that uh, some stakeholders might be uh, uh, might have additional work and you provided some kind of the benefits of the reform. So more more power to the inline ministry in, in uh, in managing the, the budget envelopes, yes? So exactly, a very, yeah. very good example. And now um, uh, I would like to ask Dritan uh, to, to ask the same questions about the stakeholder groups, main, uh, let's say, um, supporters and, and possible actually um, uh, groups which might uh, have more burden on, because of the uh yeah i mean uh, it definitely is uh, definitely is a challenging uh, it's challenging reform it's a challenging reform and uh, uh for the for the government and definitely you need the supporters there and you need uh, you need you need some uh, uh some drivers uh, from political aspects to move ahead with the with the with the reform in Albania as well as in Austria, and the Ministry of Finance, this institution is possible to uh, to implement the cool accounting. Uh, is the institution responsible for uh, uh, let's say uh, designing the accounting methodologies? Uh, and uh, a positive aspect is the fact that. Uh, uh, the government itself is already committed to move to crude accounting in, the, in its PFM strategy. Uh, the government of Albania is committed to uh, to move to move uh, uh, and to drive the uh, the reform uh, in implementing the uh, crude accounting. But I mean, this is only one uh, aspect uh, that is. Uh, I mean, okay, the, the political commitment is one thing, and the other thing is that this support should be uh, uh, should be more, uh, let's say, more strongly, and that the politicians and ministry, uh, minister of finance itself, should be more active uh, because, as we know, the. Uh, the accounting is one of the areas in the government that takes uh, most of the time less attention because of more other urgent things uh, which relates to uh, financial management, budgeting, and, uh, and uh, revenues. And the, usually the accounting sometimes uh, stays in the, in the in behind about this. And most of the times the ministers, because of these other uh, Important and uh, big issues, urgent issues. Usually, uh, they, they 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 lose they lose they lose focus on this, and they they, they need to be reminded, and they, they, their support is really is really is really important. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, as I as I mentioned uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, uh, even the even the civil society is uh, is a positive driver, as I said. 
uh, civil society uh, is a, is a positive driver because of, as I said, uh, their, uh, their need and their request for more reliable and for more uh, uh, transparent, uh, transparency, for reliable information, for more transparency from the, from the government. Uh, international community uh, is a strong supporter of, the, of, of our efforts. Uh, we, Albania, is uh, trying to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, enter into EU, integrate into, into the NATO EU, and uh, one of the uh, one of the one of the elements that is asked from us is also to reform the uh, the accounting, the public sector accounting in our country, which, as I said, this is also. Uh, uh, a strong, a strong driver for us to keep the uh, reform momentum and to continue with that with the, with the efforts. Uh, internally, the Supreme Audit Institution also is a, is a positive role. The Supreme, uh, the Supreme Audit Institution itself uh, pushes the government to uh, to uh, let's say continue with the reform. They always ask the government to. Uh, Focus more and more in implementing the the accrual accounting. Uh, uh, in terms of in terms of uh, in terms of uh, let's say stakeholders that impact negative, ne negatively, I'd say that uh, I mean, uh, I, 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 as Bernard mentioned, I mean there are maybe this uh, the the other the, maybe is the the staffing in diagnosis or the other institutions, uh, usually they, uh, they are afraid of change. They don't, they, they are really uh, custom of what they do. They do their work. They know they can do their work and they don't want to challenge themselves in other things that maybe they don't know or they don't expect, uh, they don't know what to expect from, from this kind of changes. And definitely this is, uh, this is a, uh, this is uh, challenging for them. It's going to take a lot of efforts from them in order to reform their own daily work, daily, daily routine work. So this is going to be a challenge. We, as I said, have already uh, uh, implemented or have already, uh, let's say, prepared a change management strategy. And we are already trying to, uh, to focus with these stakeholders, which uh, should be, uh, be, a, be a challenge. One, uh, and as, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning, not only the ministry, not only the minister of finance, but also the uh, ministers of, of the top, the head of other institutions need to be involved in this reform. And we have also, uh, in order to facilitate the, the, the work of their staffing and uh, definitely support their staffing, uh, during the change and during the reform uh, activities. And definitely we plan also to try to keep them aware all the time uh, with the reform activities, with the reform challenges and the, with, the reform, uh, with the reform benefits. Thank you very Again. much. So uh, I, I noted that uh, change management strategy can be actually uh, one of the solutions for to, to manage different group of uh, uh, stakeholders, and uh, now I would like to ask uh, David for for the experience, Georgian experience. Yeah, sure. So actually, a lot of things already mentioned. Uh, they apply Georgian case as well, especially what uh, Bernand mentioned about uh, about their the their circumstances. So. Uh, just to zoom out a little bit and uh, look on global perspective, uh, governments, stakeholders usually may include, but not limited to uh, parties like service recipients, donors, grantors, maybe lenders, contractors, employees, and society in general. Uh, but when it comes to specifically to accounting reform, it may be linked to groups in charge of uh, debt accounting, PPP contracts, uh, budget formulations, so those parties in charge of budget formation, budget execution reporting, also some statistical reporting, internal and external audits. Um, 
Well, I would say that the fundamental to the development of accrual accounting in uh, perhaps developing countries is uh, granting the ability to primary stakeholders, stakeholder groups to identify and to measure the government's assets and liabilities. Uh, and unless you know financial integrity is guaranteed, uh, the credibility of uh, government's financial information may suffer a lot. Uh, therefore, the financial integrity and assurance, uh, financial integrity assurance on the one hand, together with accurate accrual accounting on the other, and these are accountants' kind of professional contribution to the developing countries. So just to keep it short, um, based on our experience, if effectively collected and used, accrual data may contribute to better planning of the budget, to better oversight of revenues, to better decision making uh, when it comes to allocation of limited of scarce resources, public resources. Therefore, on the one hand, we need to uh, kind of take uh, line ministries and other uh, stakeholders out of their comfort zone, challenge themselves to develop further to align themselves with international best practices of accrual accounting. And on the other, we can and we should uh, assure and acknowledge the fact that uh, many stakeholders actually can benefit from successful P PSA reform. Uh, it, it might be benefit from, uh, it, it, these benefits might take different forms. I mean, in terms of direct impacts from publication of uh, accrual-based financial statements, perhaps, and also in terms of indirect benefits of uh, quality and completeness uh, of the fiscal reports, and also improvements to fiscal transparency. Thank you. So uh, um, I noted that uh, actually the bar shouldn't be set too low. So uh, you need to, at some point of time, take uh, some people out of the comfort zone, but there are obvious benefits uh, which can be highlighted. Yes. And now uh, I would like to ask uh, Zandra for, uh, for stakeholder groups in, uh, in Switzerland, although I, I heard that everybody was, was for, so, but let, let's hear. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, I think in, in case of S Switzerland, it was really kind of um, um, obvious because the parliament actually requested it. It was a major stakeholder group, group. but maybe um, rather from a more general perspective. I mean, there is a there is a, one of these famous jokes about accountants uh, you might know. So how to drive an accountant insane. Um, just uh, make sure that um, you basically uh, mess up his uh, Excel formulas. And this joke basically illustrates um, that usually accountants have a, a pretty strong technical focus. So they are really interested in their formula standards, IT systems, and this is really important, of course. But um, there arises a big and major problem. Um, as we have heard, Ministry of Finances are strong drivers of reform. And you, you, if you request the Ministry of Finance to successfully, successfully manage or lead a reform, they need to switch mindsets because they request something from whole of governments. And you need to think about what to give you them in return, as Bernhard told them. So there is no such thing as a free lunch, we all know. And if you request people something to do for you, you need to think about their interests, their needs, and what you could give them in favor. And I think this is really, really hard. And it is usually not the, the, the mindset of an accountant because they really think linear, straightforward in processes. They want to manage processes. They want to manage money, financial information. But leading such a reform is not about managing processes, managing money or financial information. It, it's about leading human beings. And this is, a, this is a really big mindset change. I think that's where um, this uh, paper really adds value because it really brings together these two perspectives, not only managing processes and structures, but also leading and fostering change, which is about human beings. 
And if we speak about human beings, we speak about stakeholder groups, different stakeholder groups. And we need to make sure that we know the stakeholders, that we know their interests, that we know their needs, so that we as accountants or as a minister of finance are able to frame our positions in a certain way that it is attractive to them. I think uh, at the end of the day, that really drives successful reforms. Thank you. I think that this is an excellent uh, uh, conclusion, yes, that uh, uh, this is not only about the technical uh, reform, it's also about uh, managing uh, uh, human beings, people, yes, so uh, very, very, very interesting message. Uh, so I think that we uh, exhausted our time, uh, although I, I still had a couple of more questions. Um, uh, so I would like to thank you very much uh, to all the participants and, and uh, uh, presenters. And uh, I would like to ask uh, actually Arman Vatian, Pulsar Program Manager, uh, to uh, provide closing remarks for the event. Uh, thank you, Ivona. I hope you can hear me. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, dear colleagues, and uh, for a very interesting discussion and bringing a lot of uh, practical topics quite broad uh, uh, with uh, the last of Sandro remark on the human beings. And this is probably the most challenging part of the reform, as we can uh, practically and usually see. And of course, I would like just to thank to all who contributed to this, uh, to answering to the question of how how to drive the public sector accounting reforms and how to make it happen. And this was also quite, uh, quite interesting toolkit, which is now available to use. Uh, today, we, uh, it was uh, raised all the topics of the uh, currently countries face regarding the debt levels rising, how, how to manage with that, how to manage the uh, fiscal crisis, how to connect that with the assets of the, the balance sheet approach with the state assets, uh, what about revenue mobilization and allocation, how they are allocated, how they are spent? Do we have full costing of our programs? Uh, about, uh, uh, there are also questions about linking to the sustainability and how we can use financial information for sustainability. And of course, today as well, it was re uh, repeatedly referred to the decision making, how we can improve decision making of the, of the public financial management. All this clearly uh, requires uh, accrual information. At the same time, we see that there is a, uh, many countries, they pretend that they are moving forward with the reforms. In reality, they are, there is no major, major progress in some of the countries. And, uh, and uh, as was also indicated today, countries would like to keep the status quo, uh, continue as usual, and, uh, and or target partial and complete reforms. Uh, they are approaching too much uh, formalistic uh, to, the, to those, all of those. Uh, in parallel, there is a, it was also indicated that there is a low demand on the citizen side. The citizens do not understand clearly what is this public sector account reform about, even broader PFM reform about. So how to connect, how to make the reforms happen? Uh, so what are the right drivers of the reform? And this paper, uh, and as well as this discussion, helps all of us to think in more strategically and have a structure in understanding, in mapping all the drivers into the technical, non-technical. So those were no, those were mainly non-technical uh, drivers, as well as internal and external one. So uh, uh, we are all countries facing, and this was raised like change of political leadership, how to shape and retain the goal. So even if you shape the, the goal with one leadership political, then the new comes, then how to keep it up and running. Uh, the question was about policy uh, of PSA versus quality of the information, how to collect, connect the procedures, policies, which in many countries we are very good at, with the practices which are in reality uh, uh, suffer. Uh, it was also a question about uh, there are some elements which are uh, inherent, like IFMS integrated financial management information system or cost versus uh, cost versus value, what are the economic incentives for the reforms? So those all bring the, to the interesting discussion of the disconnect between some of the technical and non-technical or the policy makers from the real environment. 
So uh, we are all uh, talking about the political will being the key element. And it was very interesting to learn and to hear that the parliament is also playing a key role and not only the Ministry of Finance in many other countries, we think that it's only the Ministries of Finance business. It's much broader, it's parliament, it's internal and external auditors role. It's combination of all those technical, non-technical, internal and external drivers, which makes the reform happen with the proper incentives for uh, uh, to make the reform. Uh, so, of course, it was also discussed that any change bring, bring resistance. So the change, um, uh, change management strategy will be needed. Uh, and bringing back, uh, go, going back to the toolkit, and uh, the toolkit helps us just to move forward, uh, to connect diagnostics, which we have under pools are the rep of uh, tool, and now we are upgrading it to the pools, which we are going to have IPSAS uh, scoring-based diagnostic tool, but also to connect uh, from the diagnostics to the real implementation and to identify the key drivers for the reform. I trust this, uh, uh, this toolkit, this publication, and today's discussion is for, it will be very helpful for our policymakers and all the participants who joined the meeting today. And again, thank you very much for very interesting, uh, uh, very interesting session and event for the benefit of our public sector accounting reform. Thanks a lot. Ivona, back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I would like to close the event. Uh, and uh, please uh, you uh, refer to our uh, website, sub uh, website of CFRR uh, for our publication, including uh, drivers of uh, public sector accounting reforms. And we'll also uh, publish uh, the recordings from uh, today's event to, together with presentations. Thank you very much. <music>